Point Church. We're glad you're here. Come on and stand. We're going to teach you a new song today. So put those hands together. Woo! Come on. Hey, hey. Arise, my soul. Remember this. He took my sin. Keep it. T. 
worship you. atmosphere of our heart today. Jesus. Whether now or then, death is not my end. I know heaven waits for me. And though the road seems long, I never walk alone cause I've got all I need to see cause I know you love me I know you found me and I know you saved me and your grace will never fail me and while I'm waiting I'm not waiting no heaven lives in me. Should I suffer long? This is not my home. Darkness cannot find me 
Come on, God's doing something in this place today, y'all. Come on. It is in me. Come on. Just let him work in you today. Come on. And I am seeing. sing this again, singing holy, but I want you to give him everything. Just push out the distraction of the week that was, and the week ahead, and the things you're excited about, the things you dread, and just give all your attention to him in this place of worship for just another couple minutes. Come on, church. Let's worship the one who loves us the most. Oh, oh let it be, let it be. Yeah. 
you give to us. Father, whatever joy that we give to you is dwarfed by the joy that you give to us. The Father, in fact, everything you give is overly, abundantly above what we could ask or think. So Father, as we stand in this place this morning in need of you, Father, we're not okay independent of you. The Father, I pray that you would fill every place in our heart with your presence. Father, you said worship is a place to renew us and refresh us, God. So I just pray that you renew and refresh us this morning. God, we thank you for the gift of your son and the life that we received in him. We thank you for the church and the people around us that are our family in Christ, God, that we can do life together. But most of all, Father, we thank you for your spirit that's with us, God, that fills us and strengthens us. And I just pray that you'd work in us this today. That, Father, we open up our hearts and we invite you to come in and to bring change and to bring growth. In Jesus' precious name, if you agree with that, say amen. Come on, y'all. Let's give him one more big praise in this place. You can do a little bit better than that. Come on. All right. All right. Awesome. We'll turn around and say hi to somebody next to you. Then you can grab your seats. Super Sunday, everybody. I'm Steven, and you've picked a great day to join us. Make sure that you stop by the Hope Lobby after service to take a quick selfie with the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda. Also, as a summer camp fundraiser for City Kids, all of our Star Wars themed decor is up for silent auction. Now, that includes the standees, the Mandalorian costume, and yes, even Baby Yoda himself. Support our kids as they go to summer camp and simultaneously outfit your Star Wars theme office back at home. Now, for those of you who are either visiting or watching for the first time, do us a favor and text the word WELCOME to 972-460-9235. It's the fastest way to learn more about our church, and it's a great way for our team members to answer any questions you might have. We are so excited about hosting the XO Conference this Friday, March 5th, and Saturday, March 6th, and we're not the only ones. Check out why Chris and Kara Willis love EXO and are planning to attend again this year. We really love this experience. It's the first time for us. We thought it was a great encouragement. Um, it, talked, it touched on some things that we had had ideas to talk about, but really didn't give us a place to talk about them. So as much as we love the, com uh, the actual conference, the drives home have been equally beneficial in some of the conversations that we've been able to have because of this weekend. So we will definitely be looking forward to coming back next year. We love it, and it was all around awesome. What? 
That's all I got. It was wonderful. The two become one voice, bro. The two become one voice. <laughs> if you haven't signed up yet, don't worry. There's still time before registration closes later this week. The cost is only $50 a couple, and we've added an online option for those who are unable to attend in person at this time. Just head over to citypointchurch.com slash XO and book your ticket today. Parents, we wanted to let you know that on Sunday, March 21st, we are having child dedications take place during the second service. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is child dedication? Well, it's simple, really. It's just a time that we set aside to celebrate and thank God for the gift of your children. It's also a time for you as parents to commit to model what following Jesus really looks like and to raise your kids to understand the importance of their faith in God, the Bible, and committing to a community through the local church. Let us celebrate with you and your family by heading over to citypointchurch.com slash events to register for our child dedication service today. I know it may be hard to believe, but our Easter services are just around the corner. Join us for one of three services on Sunday, April 4th at 9, 10, 15, or 11, 45 a.m. This is a great opportunity to invite your friends and family members as we celebrate the hope, peace, and victory we have in Jesus Christ. Oh, and did I mention that we'll have an egg hunt during all the services for kids ages three all the way up to sixth grade? Sorry, teens and adults. It just wouldn't be fair if we included y'all. And listen, just like our Christmas services, we are asking that everyone register for the services that they plan on attending ahead of time to ensure that we have plenty of space and are able to allow for social distancing. Just head over to citypointchurch.com slash Easter to register for a service or learn more about what all will be happening that day. Now, make sure to get your notes ready and lean in as Pastor Eddie wraps up our February series, I Promise. We found out recently we have people um, in different states, and we have a couple people not even in our country. So it's a pretty weird thing that's happening. So anyway, it's cool. Happy to have it. Half of you have me. Happy to have everybody here. So uh, anyway, good to see you this morning. Good to worship with you today. I do want to remind you, if this service gets a little crowded for you, you know, because of all the distant stuff, there's more room in our first service, and there's always typically more room towards the front of the auditorium than there is in the back of the auditorium. So if you want to sit up here close... Uh, in the splash zones, my spit can reach you. This is maybe that's why nobody sits up here. They're like, no, I need wipers when I sit down there. So, anyway, happy to have you. So, today we're continuing our series called I Promise. We've talked about the promises we make to ourselves, the promises we make to our spouse, the promises that we make to God. And, and I think these things are good. I think these promises are good. In fact, I know that they're, they're good. I, I think they, when we make a promise, we're making something high priority in our life above the other decisions that we make and we're just saying hey this is an area i need to grow in this is an area my faith needs to develop this is an area where my relationship needs to expand or grow Um, we do these things i think sometimes with great intentions but then sometimes our willpower is not as strong as our promise and so i want to help you today um, with that because i don't want us to get to a place where we're never willing to kind of reach forward because if we don't challenge ourselves no one will and if we, are the only, if we don't allow ourselves to grow, nobody's going to force us to grow. Your, your marriage could be in trouble. Your business could be floundering. Your health could be nosediving. Your heart could be growing cold. And if you never step up and say, hey, I need to grow in this area. I need to make some changes. I promise that I will grow here. And I promise I'll grow here. But nobody else will. And so today I want to learn from the children of Israel what happens to them when they broke promises. And then how do we not break promises that we make in our life? When the children of Israel left Egyptian slavery, it was a great moment. It was, they had been enslaved for 400 years. Generations of Israelites never knew freedom. 
you were born in slavery and you died in slavery. You never made a decision what you did with your life, never made a decision where you lived. It was all forced upon them. And this bad for the children of Israel, what we see, became their normal. They no longer noticed necessarily the slavery. In fact, Scripture tells us that they kind of adopted that as their normal. And what we're going to see is Egypt was not just around the children of Israel. Egypt got inside the children of Israel. When it got inside of them, that when it, it became this invisible ceiling in their life, it became their normal. And it's something, if something at some point broke on the inside of them, that fight, that pushback, generation after generation, it just died. It, it's, 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 it's not that they didn't want to change, they just didn't see the need for change. And I'll say this in our life, anything that we permit in our life, it will persist in our life. If there's something in your life you just allow to be there, it's going to persist is going to have the persistence to stay there. And the day we decide I will no longer permit this attitude, permit this to be a part of our marriage, permit this to be a part of our family, permit this to be a part of my health, permit this to be part of our finances, that's the day that you challenge that thing and you get in its face and say, I promise this will change. And I think life problems can be like that. You know, one of the things that I think we're all sensitive to today, and I may step on a toe or two, but that's what a good pastor does every once in a while, is challenge you. And some of y'all, I shared about marriage a couple weeks ago, and some of y'all have, rough, have had a rough patch in your marriage, but it's not a rough patch. It's gone on for years now. And when something goes on for years in a marriage, it's no longer a rough patch. It's a problem. And I want to encourage you today that you say, well, you know, it, I don't know if we need to deal with it. And I, I tell you this, if, if something is driving your marriage, this is the enemy's goal for your marriage. He wants to destroy your marriage like an Egyptian slave master would. But long before he destroys your marriage, he wants, to, he wants to just suck the life out of you. He wants to emotionally wreck you. He wants to destroy your trust and the ability to love others. And then once he's done with that, he'll leave you empty-handed with a divorce. And maybe your spouse has said, hey, hey, I think we should go to this EXO conference. And maybe he said, no, I don't think we need to. Or maybe he said something like, well, I don't think we can afford it. And I mean this, I'm trying to be nice here, but $50 is a lot cheaper than a divorce. All right, okay, y'all could hate me later, but right now I'm going to tell you the truth. So maybe whatever you got going on next weekend, maybe you should cancel it. Cancel the golf with the boys or the brunch with the girls. Maybe find a way to get, take care of the kids and invest in your marriage. Some of y'all have like a tumor growing on your marriage and you refuse to see the doctor. And it's time to take care of that. That's Egypt. That's not God's best for you. God did not create marriage as a torture device for human beings. He created it to be a sanctuary of love and peace. Not that any marriage is perfect. Not that you're never going to have conflict in marriage. But some of y'all have a, a place that I think God really wants to help. So I want to encourage you to sign up for XO if you have not already. And you don't have to be in trouble in your marriage. In fact, most people that go to XO, that's not their experience. A lot of people just say, hey, we have a great marriage and we want to keep it great. So we're going to keep putting time and energy into it. It's like eating healthy. It just keeps you moving forward to the direction you want to go. But there's other things in our life that are Egypt, and the enemy wants to convince you that that abnormal is normal. Some of us live in emotional pain. Some of us live in fear and anxiety. Some of us live in anger. Some of us live with this fighting, nitpicking personality. Some of us live with this poor self-worth where you're always trying to prove your value by what you own or by what you do. Some of us live in crisis. Some of us live with spiritual oppression. Some of us live just finding fault in others but never really dealing with what's going on on the inside of us. Some of us live just that critical life. And we, we, we call it normal because the Egypt, the, the Israelites just assumed that, that this was normal because they've always lived that way. But God came along and said, this is not my best for you. This normal is not the normal I created for you. And so he said, I, I promise to make a change to you. And they had to make a promise to change for him. And so that's my, my goal today is I want to help you find a conviction for a place of promise. Because promises made out of convenience don't last. Only promises made out of conviction do. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And God, you're so good, and you're so kind, and you're so merciful, and you have so much good for us. So many times we frustrate you and your hand of goodness in our life by the things we hold on to in our mind and our heart. And so, Father, I just invite you now through your word and through your Holy Spirit to reveal these things to us. Father, to set us free. The Father, all of us can see something today in our life that lingers from the slavery to sin that we used to be. We can find freedom of it. In Jesus' name, amen.
So today I want to use the children of Israel to help you see, help us see ourselves. Um, as you know, the children of Israel, this is really a picture of deliverance. Um, they were held prisoner. Basically, they moved there willingly, but over time became the slaves of the nation of Egypt. And God raised up a man named Moses uh, uh, to come and deliver the children of Israel. And before Moses ever got to the Pharaoh, he spoke to the children of Israel. And he basically preached the thing that God wants you free, and God's come to free you. And he's going to break the back of Pharaoh and Egypt to set you free. And basically, he built this expectation and this hope and this desire for them to be free. It was God's voice saying that things can change. You can be free, and your children can be free. What is running your family for several generations does not have to continue running in you. It was a voice of freedom. In fact, Exodus 40 captures this conversation. Now, one of the things I love about Moses is Scripture says that God called Moses, but Moses says, I'm not good at public speaking. So he, he called his, his, his brother Aaron to come and, and be the, the speaker. Or, yeah, nephew or a cousin? Uh, brother, yes, sorry, sorry. I'm getting relatives confused in the Bible. It's like a family reunion up here. And so what, what I find interesting about Moses and Aaron is that Moses would go with Aaron in front of him, and he would tell him, hey, tell them this. And then Aaron would say it. It was like this weird triangle communication. It would be as if I asked somebody to come up here and preach, but they're like, I'm not comfortable speaking in front of people, but if this guy can come stand next to me, he can interpret my words to y'all. And as I always read this story, this thing about Moses always gives me great peace that God is willing to use us even when we're imperfect and we're flawed. But here was God's deliverer, one of the greatest leaders biblically, and, and led a nation out of 400 years of slavery, and the man cannot stand and do exactly what I'm doing right now without falling apart. And so here it is. Aaron told them, that's because Moses told them, everything Moses had said, had said to Moses. He also performed signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and they worshiped. Notice that, that they believed, and then they felt the concern of the Lord, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. They started with this idea that, yes, we can be free, and they started with this, this concept that, that we believe in God, and not only do we believe in him, but he cares about us, and he wants to set us free. He doesn't want us to live this way anymore. And it reminds me of something Jesus did in John eight thirteen. It says this, Jesus said to the Jews, that have believed in him, if you continue in my word and you are truly my disciples and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus lays down the same thing that Moses did for the children of Israel. If you believe in God's goodness to deliver you, he goes, you can be free. And Jesus came so that we could find freedom in our life. And in fact, the word, he gave us the word of God and he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to find that. Because this is the toughest thing about freedom in our life is to define what should be there and what shouldn't be there. Because when you've lived in Egypt generation after generation, what is abnormal now has become your normal. And it's really hard to see yourself separate from it. Now listen to this in Hebrews 11. For the word of God is alive and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Scripture says this, that because I understand that you've lived this way a long time, you need help discerning what is of me and what isn't of me, what is good for you, what is bad for you, what is abnormal, what is normal, because you're going to assume because you've lived in it your whole life that that's normal and you can't imagine freedom outside of it. The children of Israel never lived free. Generation after generation. In fact, one scripture says that as they walked through the desert because they had the choice of what to wear and what to do, that they wore all of their finest clothes and all the jewelry they had been taken from Egypt. And so they're walking through the desert with their bling on. It was like a bling camping trip, right? And here the children of Israel are for the first time in their life, wake up when they want to wake up, do what they want to do, living their own life because they lived a life of bondage. And that's what Jesus came to say to us. He says, listen, you don't even understand the freedom that I've given you because you've never lived in the freedom that I have for you. He says, so I've given you tools and I've given you resources. The spirit of truth will help you with that. The word of God will help you with that. To divide between what is of me, spirit, and what is of your flesh, the soul. He goes, because there's things that you've been so habitually living in fear that has been so much a part of your life for so long, you can't imagine looking at life without those glasses on. And he goes, I'm going to give you resources and tools because I want to set you free, but I need you to walk in what I've given you. Not only sometimes because these things that we have in our life, this bondage, this, this 
thing that Egypt's put on side of us, what the world's put on side of us, what our sins put on, we hide it from others. We don't tell everybody. And sometimes that's a good thing that you don't show everybody your trash. You show a select group of people. And you always, of course, post it on Facebook. That's what every good person does, right? <laughs> For people to like and put sad faces like, oh, I'm sorry, you're a bad human, you know. <laughs> and we hide things. And sometimes those things are even hidden from us. We end up in messes that we don't know how we got in, but ultimately, if you really track down the path, it's our own brokenness that leads us to that place of brokenness. It's that fear that leads us perpetually to these things in our life. The scripture says that when we open up his word and when we allow the spirit of truth to come, that all of a sudden everything we are is laid bare before him. We can't hide it from people, but we cannot hide it from him. That's the beauty of his love. He sees truly who we are, yet he still loves us. And we're afraid to be laid bare before people because we're afraid they won't love us anymore if they really knew us. And the beauty of God is that he knows truly who you are, the good, the bad, the ugly, the potential of who you are, and the reality of who you are today, and he loves you. But he's given us tools, and he's given us a gift, a, a gift in our life that comes through the Word, and that comes through the Holy Spirit, and it's a gift called conviction. Now, conviction is different than condemnation. Condemnation makes you feel bad. It says you will never add up. You will never do this. Look at you falling over yourself again. Look at you being afraid again. Look at you saying the wrong thing to your spouse again. Look at you failing at that promotion at work again. You're just a loser. You're just this. That's condemnation. But conviction is what God gives us. And conviction comes along and says, this is where you are today, but you could be so much better. You have so much more potential in your life. You don't have to be bound by that anymore. You don't have to look at life through that lens anymore. You don't have to be held captive by that anymore. I broke the back of Egypt. I broke the back of the Pharaoh. I broke the back of the power of that sin of the enemy in your life so that you can be free. And when we live from a place of conviction, conviction rise, raises us up and says, this is the potential of who we are. It's not condemnation says you will never be that. Conviction says you are designed to be that. And we need God's conviction in our life to see what is possible. From Moses coming in, he was the voice of truth, almost like the, the Holy Spirit in our life. He was a voice of truth simply to say, this is what God has for you. So many times in our life, we make promises that don't last, and then we feel so bad because you had a fight or you did something you didn't want to say you are going to do. The problem is that so many times we look to ourselves to keep those promises, but your emotions don't have the horsepower to change you. You have to look in the mirror of truth and bring conviction into your life through the spirit of truth to truly change you. And that's my first point today. Conviction keeps promises, not condemnation. You're never going to change out of guilt and feeling bad about yourself. You're going to change out of a conviction of who you can truly be and the freedom that God has for you. Because that guilt goes away over time. You slowly get used to it. You slowly runs away. Your wife actually talks to you again. And all of a sudden you stop changing. But conviction comes in and says, no, I am better than this. I am different. I don't have to be this way in my life. Because here's the truth. It's the reason God sent Moses. Even though Israel wanted to be free at some point in their life, they didn't have the power to free themselves. And this is the truth about you and me is we don't have the power to free ourselves. You can't change your heart. You can change some habits. You can change some practices. But you can't change your heart. That's the business of God. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. We overestimate how powerful we are, and we underestimate how powerful God is. Amen. We think, well, you know what? Hey, when I need to change, man, I can, I can whip that into shape. I can change it. No, you can't. You've lived in slavery for 20, 30, 40 years. You're going to continue to live that way. You need the power of God to come into your life and to set you free. And some of us sit in this room thinking, Eddie, I don't know if I can be free. My mom was this way. My dad was this way. It's kind of our family thing. It's just the way we are. And we sit in services like that. The word comes up, but we don't believe, and so we're not free. And conviction comes along and says, listen, believe in the power of God because I truly believe this in my heart. Sitting in this simple service on a Sunday morning that this word can come in and break some shackles off of your heart. And the spirit of God himself can liberate you in a way that you walk out of this room a different person and you feel lighter than the way you walked in. You walked in with a ton of bricks on your back. I truly believe that if you allow God and God give God the permission, he can take that ton of bricks off of your back and you can walk out of this place and walk into the new 
new life that God has for you. God is able. Don't underestimate what God can do in your life in a moment. Galatians 4 puts it this way. He says, because you are sons, God sent his spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba Father. He says, I want to teach you the free language because all you know is the slave language. He says, I want to teach you how to talk like a son because you've never talked to me like a son. You've always talked to me like you were a slave and you were bound to something. He says, verse 7, so you're no longer a slave. You're no longer controlled by things. You're no longer at the mercy of things out of your control. That's not who you are anymore. But you're God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. God has made you an heir. He goes, but you're living your life like you're a slave, like you're bound to these things, and you have to repeat these things, and depression is just who you are because that's what they say you are, and and, and anger is who you are because that's what they say you are, and your insecurities is who you are because of that they say that's who you are. You're living like a slave, like somebody has the power to tell you who you are besides the one who created you. And he says, I'm going to send my spirit on the inside of you to live on the inside of you so that you speak differently in your life and you learn how to communicate and live in the wide open spaces that I have provided for you as a son and daughter of God. Verse 5 in Galatians, or verse 1 in Galatians 5 says this, it is freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for the sake of freedom that he did it. No greater agenda. He says, stand firm then and, and do not let yourselves be burned again by the yoke of slavery. He says, because you can be positionally free, but practically bound. Now, let me explain that to you. In other words, God has already paid the price for your freedom. It is a check that has already been written with your name on it. That's that's positionally free. But practically free is that you never cash that check. In other words, you, you never... And take that inheritance that's been given to you. It's almost as somebody handed you a car and said, this car is yours. That home is yours. Here's the keys. But you never turn on the ignition and you never open the door. Practically, it's yours. Positionally, it's yours. But practically, you don't possess it. And when the Spirit of God comes in, he says, I want you to be free. He goes, because I don't want to pull you out of Egypt like I did the children of Israel. But Egypt never gets out of you. So you keep living like you're bound, not living like you're free. That breaks the heart of God that he did all this work to li- so we could live differently, be these people of joy, have these relationships of love and walk in forgiveness and not carry the weight of the world on our shoulders that we stomp around this little blue planet like we're the same in slavery as anybody else on this planet. He says, that breaks my heart, so I'm sending my very own spirit, the spirit of my son on the inside of you to teach you how to talk that way. Because here's the second thing is that my promises require, your promises require his power in your life. You need him. See, sometimes we choose to remain distant. We don't cash the check. We don't unlock the door. So the children of Israel, just like the children of Israel, they were finally out of Egypt, and they were physically free, but their hearts weren't. They, they no longer lived in the prison, but they were slaves in their own heart. And, and sometimes when you live that way, regardless of what God's given you, you don't possess it. And so what I I want to talk about now is I'm not talking about earning something that God's given you. I'm simply talking about possessing something that's already been given to you. This is not something for a day in the future. This day already occurred 2,000 years ago. And when you gave your heart and your life to Christ, God handed you the keys and said, it's all yours. You're free. It's done. In fact, God was so worried about the children of Israel, he says, I know that even though they're positionally free, they're practically slaves in their hearts and their minds. He says, so I would like to take them straight into Israel, into Canaan. It's only an 11-day journey, he says, but I'm afraid they're not going to be able to do the things that they need to do to find their freedom in their life. He says, so I'm going to have to take them on this slower path. And what should have taken them 11 days, plus one, <laughs> took them 40 years, four decades, to possess the same thing that God intended for them from day one. Now, this is something for us to think about sitting here in this church this morning. Is there something that God has for us that we've already waited a decade to receive that he says you literally could have had in one moment? Is there freedom in your life, things that you're carrying around, things that you're worried about that God says, I did not design that for you, but you've got Egypt in your heart, and so Egypt is now in charge of you. Listen to what God did. He says, when the Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road through the land of the Philistines, though it was shorter. For God says the people will face war and they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Why did he do this? He says, because I don't think they're willing to fight for the freedom that I've given them. 
I don't think they're able to resist that pressure. He goes, so instead of allowing them to stand on their own two feet, rod on their back and face the enemies of their soul and say, listen, we're heading to God's promises in our life. He says, instead, he goes, I'm afraid they'll bow or worse, they'll run back to who they used to be. He says, so instead, what I'll do is I'll just put them on this long, slow path, basically where they don't have to really overcome anything. They just have to endure time and hardship until, until they get there. And there's a lot of people today that live kind of enduring life, and they're not having the joy. But God says if you could simply turn around and have a little bit of fight, a little gravel in your gut, as I used to say, and stand up and face the enemies of your soul and look at anger and look at these things and say, that is not who I am anymore. That's not what God's best for me, and you're not going to be a part of my life anymore. I'm choosing today. I'm drawing a line in the sand. God paid a price so that you don't dominate me anymore. He says, if you're unwilling to do that, then you're forced on this other path where you, yes, God's going to provide for you and God's going to meet your needs, but it's not the life that I have for you. In fact, God was right. Facing some problems, they said this in Exodus 14. Did we not say to you, talking to Moses, leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. I've talked to Christians and say, I don't feel like serving God's any better. Like, ever since I've come to church, I, I lost my job, I did this, did this, this, this. Slavery was nice. Had my meals covered, had fun on the weekends. Don't remember most of it, but I think I had fun. I miss Egypt. Why can't I just go back to Egypt? And so for us as believers, it's understanding this about God. God can't do it for you, but God can do it with you. What he was looking for in the children of Israel say, I can't do everything. There's certain Philistines you're going to have to face to go where you want to go. There's certain enemies you're going to have to defeat. I can't do that for you, but I can do it with you. If you step up to the plate and swing, I'll help you hit that ball every single time. But they were afraid. A few years ago, and I always joke about this dog, but I, she's actually come to be an enjoyable dog for me, um, is Bones. And Bones is our dog. And uh, here's a picture of her um, relaxing. So the way she got the name Bones is I have a friend who has some land, and he lets him go out and hawk out and do different things. And so for Christmas break, uh, we took the family out there a couple of years ago, and Allie and the kids found this dog living on a pile of hog bones and eating deer corn to survive. She's really skinny. And so I knew as soon as they fed this dog and had, drew her up to the house where we were staying that we were not leaving without that dog. Not because I wanted a dog, but I would have a row of people in the back that are crying and asking questions. Why are we leaving it, Dad? Why are we leaving it? So I decided let's just take it home and we'll give it away when we get home, right? We'll SPCA it. Like, I'll sell it on the side of the road, you know, whatever. And so through a bit of circumstances, we ended up keeping the dog. But when we first got her, she was feral. She didn't like us. She would go hide all day from us. She was very protective of her food. I even took her in the yard. I was like, well, my German shepherd I used to have, I'd throw the ball and she'd go get it for me like a champ, like a real dog. So <laughs> let me go get a ball. And I threw it and she just looked at me and just kind of walked off like, you go get it, loser. And just like, I'm like, you are such a loser dog. Like, you know, and she just was not anything. She was scared of everything. Couldn't give her a bath without her like, ah, nothing. And every time we opened the front door, it's like she was escaping a prison. Like she was just, boom, gone and be like, well, I hope the dog catcher can get her because I can't run that fast, you know. <laughs> and she just, she was so feral and so wild in her heart, she couldn't love her family. But over time and with lots and lots of food, we convinced her that we liked her. Here's another picture. So this is her uh, relaxing in the sun. Here's the picture three. That's her with her stuffed animal on her bed on this sofa. <laughs> um, and her feral days are gone. She lets us love on her. Now she comes up and leans on us and wants love. And if we'd open the door, she'll go do a zoomie in the driveway and then run back in because she's like, I ain't going out there. This is free food inside. Like, I, you know, it's warm. And her little heart's changed, and so now we're her family. And every morning I get up and she has her little routine with me. In fact, when I study, I, I work from home a lot now, and she'll sit on the sofa behind me. That's the next pick. And what she's doing there is she starts talking to me, going, rah, 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 until I go over and scratch her chin. And then finally, I'm just like, stop 
stop. Like, I've got, I'm trying to hear the Lord for the church. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> but now she went from this dog that couldn't stand to be around us, was afraid to be around us, to where all she wants to do is be with us. And what it kind of taught me watching her kind of fold into our family is this. Sometimes God has all the good intentions in the world for us, but we just don't utilize it. We're afraid of him, and we're afraid of that freedom because we've never lived in that freedom before. See, some people in this room, including myself, I've had moments where I've never lived that way, so I didn't know what I was missing until I started to live that way. We're all tempted to serve our Egyptians, even after we're free, instead of facing the battles that allow us to possess all that God has for us. See, our ultimate enemy is the devil. And Scripture says that his ultimate vice in our life is through our thought life. If you think about the Israel and the Egyptians, they were brought out of Egypt. Egypt was no longer represented physically in their life. Egypt lived in their minds. And that was the struggle of Moses. It was the struggle of God is how do I get Egypt out of their minds even though I physically conquered Egypt itself? They drowned in the sea. The horse and rider were thrown into the sea. You'll never see them again. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. For the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What is strongholds? The enemy would take territory, build these walls so that you cannot penetrate those walls so they continue to hold that. And scripture says we have the power now to demolish those things in our life. We demolish this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. In other words, we find these things, these Egyptian thoughts in our mind, and we go to war against them. When we take every thought captive, we make it obedient to Christ. So we take these thoughts and we expose the lie. And we say, I know I may have spent the last 30 years, the last 20 years, the last 50 years thinking like this. But this thought right here is a thought of Egypt slavery. And I will not think like that anymore. In fact, Moses exemplified this in Exodus uh, eleven twenty seven. 27. It says, by faith, he left not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw who, him who was invisible. Moses didn't struggle like the children of Israel because Moses knew that he could trust in the invisible God, not in the visible king. Moses switched from an outside battle to an inside battle, and he won the inside battle. That way he defeated the outside battle. And so many times in our life, we're losing on the outside because what's happening on the inside has already been defeated. And so what, what God's calling us to, and what, God, what I, my prayer for you, is that we would have a different tone and we would recognize that there's things in our life that are representative of Egypt and it's so comfortable because we've lived that way so long, but God says, I've got so much better for you. That's the third thing. Like the children of Israel, we must fight for the promises that we make. We can't passively sit there and say, I sure wish I wouldn't be uh, uh, anxious anymore. We've got to fight for that in our life. I sure wish I wouldn't be hypercritical of the people that I love. We've got to fight for that in our life. I wish I wasn't insecure anymore and, and saw everything through that lens. You've got to fight for that in your life. I sure wish I wasn't hopeless and had some hope and had some dreams in my life. You fight for that in your life. You face those giants and you took them out. God took them out of Egypt, but Egypt never got out of them. We've got to get Egypt out of us, and God's given us the tools to do it. Scripture goes on to tell us that after 40 years, four decades, these people that thought this way finally died off, and they arrived in the land that God had for them, a land to prosper them, a land to grow their family, but also a land that they had to fight some fortified cities, and they had to fight battles. And this is the truth about the battles that we face in our life. Though we may be insecure and uncomfortable in facing them, we're simply delaying them. We're not destroying them. Those battles of freedom in your life, that, that, those thoughts that control you and, and push you in directions you shouldn't go in your life, by, by not dealing with it, they're not going away. You're just delaying it. You're, you're disobeying it. It doesn't change what needs to be done. God and his ways never change. You're never going to outweigh God. So whatever you're facing right now, say, Eddie, I've tried before. Well, try again. Fight like it's your life, like it depends on it. Say, God, I thank you that you've equipped me. I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of this conflict in our marriage. I'm tired of this hopelessness in my life. I'm tired of this anxiety about the little things of life. God, I thank you that you've purchased more for me, that even though I've lived this way my whole life, God, I thank you that there is a better way for me to live, and I know you have the power and the wisdom and the authority to do it in my life. And so God raised up a leader named Joshua, who was actually with Moses the whole time. And he went, uh, it's a long story, but Joshua is a man of courage. It says this in Joshua 1. 
Joshua, uh, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. And this is what's key. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Here is the key to him possessing the land. He says, everywhere you go, if you just go one acre in and one mile in and stop, he goes, that's all you'll possess. He goes, you go two acres in, two miles in, that's what you'll possess. You go 2,000 acres in, 200 miles in, that's what you'll possess. You decide how much of this promise that you're going to possess in your life. I've made the promise. I made it available. But you're the one that decides how much of it you'll enjoy. And God has done the same thing for you and me. There's things in our life that we just make a decision. We go one yard into it and say, well, that's all of it I want. That's, that's plenty. I can just live here. But the promise is, listen, I, for Christ, Christ is, for freedom's sake, he made you free. So if we just keep edging into it, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm not depressed anymore. I, I'm not even anxious about stuff. What, what, else, what else could be here? Wow, I'm, I'm filled up with God. I, I feel like I, man, I got God's power in my life. Wow, you know, man, I just talked to my neighbor, and, and they're coming to church. They got saved. They're getting baptized on Sunday. What the heck? This stuff works. It really has to depend, I think, in our life, just like it did for Joshua. How far are you willing to walk into what God's given you? How timid are you? Maybe you pick up the pace and just start running towards God and running towards the things he has for you. God tells Joshua, basically, you decide how much of this land you want. When you call it quits, I'll quit too. But it's all yours, as far as you can go. See, Israel needed a new leader. Mentally, not a new God. And some of us are blaming God when we simply need to grow. Because God's paid the price. For freedoms, He set you free. And you say, Well, I just don't understand why God's doing it. And God's like, I don't understand why you keep thinking like Egypt like you're in Egypt. He goes, You're free. Israel, part of their, their thing is they would always blame Moses, they blame God, but they would never blame themselves. They'd always say, well, we're going to worship a new God, the God of the Egyptians. So they're always trying to find the fix somewhere else, and they never settle down and say, you know what? We've got Egypt on the inside of us, but God set us free from that. Let's work on the Egypt on the inside of us. 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. They're a Joshua on the brink of their own promised land. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. It's time for you to cross that Jordan River. And everywhere you set your foot, it's yours. Moses is dead. Egypt's back's been broken. It doesn't have the power. The only power it has is what lies between your two ears. This new life is in your old body. But make no mistake, it's a brand new life that God has for you. Honestly, the way you can tell who's leading you right now is where you end up. If you're still living in a circle, even after you met Jesus, the same cycle of junk you've been living in, most likely Egypt's in charge. But the day you decide to truly say, I want to walk in that freedom, I'm going to persevere for that freedom, no compromise. I've got a conviction. I don't have to live this way anymore. God's going to walk you into that freedom. Typically, the fruit of how you live is the proof of who you've, who you've been following. If it keeps taking you backwards into fear and anger and bitterness and doubts and conflicts, most likely it's not the Spirit of God leading you. Most likely the old you. If the old you held grudges, the new you is forgiving. If the old you was stingy and hard to get along with, the new you is generous and gracious and merciful. If the old you is full of doubt, then the new you is full of faith. It may be worth your time this week if you feel like you've been going around like the children of Israel to stop and see what of Egypt has remained on the inside of you even though God has set you free. It's worth the time to say, God, I know you have better for me because I've read your word. I'm just not experiencing the better that you have. God, I, don't, I know you can't do it for me, but God, I want you to do it with me. Teach me how to walk into this new way. I remember um, in the hospital, um, when I had to deal with my own mortality at a pretty acute moment 
I decided when I get out, because I knew I was going to get out, like, felt like prison. Maybe that's why I use those terms. Um, was God, there's things I don't want to carry around with me anymore. There's feelings that I've had that I don't want to feel. Because if I only get to live one day, I don't want to waste that day on that. There's things I want to say to people. If I only have one day to live, then I don't want to live a day without saying that. There's things I want to do. And if I only have one day to live, then I want to make sure I get to do those things. Scripture only promises you one day. It says you never know about tomorrow. We don't. For me, that became a reality that I, it freed me in many ways. There's things I used to worry about that now I'm just like, who cares? If I'm only living one day, I'm not living it worrying about that. I'm free. That moment helped me recognize some Egypt in my life that I had been a prisoner to my entire life. So today I'm free in those areas. I'm at peace in certain areas of my life that I was anxious about before I had that experience. And my prayer is that you don't have to be hooked up to a heart pump in a hospital for 40 days to realize that. That the Holy Spirit can show up right now and expose some things in your life that you've been a prisoner to that God has set you free from. For some, maybe it's joining an XO small group this semester, men's group and women's group. And that's exactly what we talk about, how to put your old life to bed, how to deal with that. Now, it's a tool. We can't guarantee results. Only you bring it, and you and the Spirit of God working together can bring change. But we try to give you tools in that, in that small group to simply help bring the change. Maybe for some it's attending EXO and actually taking the marriage issues in your, in your marriage seriously enough to get some help for it. I don't know what your pathway looks like. But I do know that many of us in this room, myself included, need to move forward into the land that God's possessed. Because everywhere I set my foot, He's given me. Every time I move forward in Him... That's the new level that I rise to in my life. And what a gift from God. You can live a life to simply say, God, I want more of you. And he says, everything you want of me, I will give you. I have no no's available. It's all yes. It's all green lights. You're the one that hits the brakes. It's never going to be me. That's amazing. Last thing is this. You have to allow the new you, the 2 Corinthians 5.17 you, to make the problem. The the new you to make the new promises. Make promises according to who you are now, not according to who you used to be. And you'll possess all that God has for you. For some, maybe it's even water baptism. God's done so much for you. God saved you. He put his son on a cross, rose from the dead, but you've never made a public declaration that you passed from death into life. Maybe that's the moment you stand up and say, hey, this is part of me walking into the new territory that I have, that I'm letting the world know that, hey, I'm a follower of Christ now. I don't know what that step is, but I guarantee you, if you pray about it, God will reveal it to you. So let me pray for all of us. Heavenly Father, come to you in the precious name of Jesus. God, I thank you that your love perseveres on us, that it never gives up, that your spirit calls us to greater, calls us to more freedom, calls us to be liberated. And so I pray for those in this room today that have lived a, a bound life, they could be a free life. God, that you will reveal that to them today to help us all become the people that you called us to be. Father, we love you this morning, and we give you all the praise and the honor. Right now, Spirit of God, take your word and go to town in our life. Expose those areas where Egypt lifts so we can be free. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed, uh, Romans 10 9 says this if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you'll be saved maybe you're sitting in this room and maybe you're just online but regardless you don't have a relationship with God I want to invite you today to make that decision to pray a very simple prayer to begin that journey of your relationship with God with every head bowed every eye closed if you're in this room today and you say hey I want to be a follower of Christ I want to know God if that's you can you raise your hand real fast nobody's looking around it's just you and me that's you. Let me see your hand this morning. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Thank you. Others, you say, that's me. Amen. Well, let's all say this prayer together right now. Um, just repeat it after me. Everybody say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. 
I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you with all of my heart from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise for those that made that decision. The next verse after verse 17, that says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new cre creation, a new person, says this. All of this is a gift from God, that new life, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. God says, that new person that I made you into brings people to me. And I want to invite you, church, to invite people to church. That even though with all the craziness that's gone on in the world, people still need Jesus. And I'm going to say this all year long until y'all get tired of hearing it. But invite somebody to church. You never know. They may say yes. And they may show up. And God just may change their life. Same way online. Send out a link. Invite somebody to be with us and worship with us. Let's not stop being the church, even though the world around us is a little crazy at times. Amen? That's why we have these Easter cards for you to invite people to church. Uh, I want to receive our offering. Our offering is simply an act of worship and generosity. Proverbs 3, 9 says this, All Lord, the wealth of the best part of everything you produce. You can give online, give via text messages. The point is, our simple desire is you pray about what you should give and you worship God with what he's blessed you with. That's the end goal for us. And from that, uh, we know God's going to meet your needs and God will meet the needs of this church. Um, I do, before we give, want to thank those who have helped us with some of our water damage this weekend, getting the building ready. We're still working through that. Um, but thank you for those who showed up and helped tape off all of our floors for service today. So let's pray over our giving. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to give. We worship you with what you blessed us with this morning. I thank you, the Father, without you, we wouldn't even have the strength to do it. So I pray for those needing work today. I pray for uh, jobs. I pray for connections. I pray for those seeking promotions or have businesses. God, I thank you for opening doors. For, Father, that you would put seed in the hands of those that sow. And that, Father, that your kingdom would have more than enough to do all that it's called to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I forgot to mention, but I want to mention real quick, if you, gave, if you prayed that prayer with me today, whether you raised your hand or not, you meant it. Grab this card. It's in the back of all of our seats, the Next Step card. Follow those simple instructions at some point today. Those online, they'll have those same instructions up there for you. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Crystal. Y'all have a blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday. Hello, City Point. Yeah, give it up for Pastor Eddie. Wasn't that an amazing message? It was awesome. I hope you guys feel as good as you look. And I trust that everybody watching online, you are feeling and looking good as well. As Pastor Eddie mentioned, my name is Crystal. I have a few things to remind you about before we end service today. I looked at the radar. It doesn't look like it's raining yet, so it looked like we might have some time to go eat and get home before the storm comes. But uh, we wanted to congratulate everyone again. If you made a decision in person or online, we are so excited and just thrilled that you made the best decision you'll ever make. If you will text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen behind me, if you're watching online, it's at the bottom of the screen. We have some team members who would love to reach out to you and just send you some materials that are going to kind of help you along and help guide you in your new relationship with God. Also, I know you've seen him. The Mandalorian is out there. He is picture ready. So make sure you grab a pic. If you post it on social media, please tag us at City Point Church. And then also the silent auctions are going on and we're auctioning off all of our little um, Star Wars standees. And I even heard the Mandalorian outfit is going to be auctioned off too. I'm not sure, but I think it is. Um, so Make sure you're a part of that. And then last but not least, I love you like EXO. You love me like EXO. Come on. I love you like EXO. You love me like <laughs> Y'all are awesome. Yes, that is a song. But as I've mentioned several times in service today, that is also our marriage conference that's happening this weekend. And they just wanted me to remind you that uh, if you're not here and you're not able to come to register in person, we do have an option for you to register online. If you'll just go to citypointchurch.com, uh, all the details will be there and you can register there and then attend this weekend. So with that said, if I could have everybody here stand up and let's pray. But before I do that, I would like to invite our prayer team to come down. 
Uh, as they are every single Sunday, we have a prayer team who's here to help pray with you. Trust God, believe God, uh, or believe with you that God's going to answer any prayer requests that you have. So please uh, utilize our prayer team. Uh, they want to celebrate with you when God answers your prayers, and we would like to do that too. So they are down here at the end of every service as they are right now. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, God, that we are able to make promises to you. We're able to make promises to ourselves and to those around us. God, I pray that the words that we heard today, that your Holy Spirit would bring them back to our remembrance this week. God, that as we have been delivered from Egypt, Lord, we know that you are working with us to get Egypt out of us. And so I just pray that things will be highlighted in our life that we can apply and that we will see victory in those areas. We will see ourselves a lot further uh, from this day forward than we were this time last or next year, God. And so I thank you that you continue to do a work in our community, God, as we reach out to others for our Easter services, for our conferences that we're having. God, I thank you that you're going to use those to do great things in people's lives. And you'll be with us this week. Open doors. Give us wisdom where we need to keep us healthy and strong in Jesus name. Well, we love you. We'll see you this weekend for XO or Sunday. You guys have a great week.